So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to this podium, the man of the hour, our champion in criminal justice, Meek Mill. Hey, what's up? Hi, everybody doing in the building? Somebody can fix this right here? Yeah, I think it's good. I, I could hold it too. Uh, yeah, I just came here today to say thank you to everybody for having me a part of this. You know, I am a young kid that come from one of these environments like you're talking about. Uh, I can just speak on many things that you said, like uh, my father being killed in South Philadelphia and my mom, seeing my mom go through what she went through when my father was killed, like you said, the person that killed my father was still in the loose in the streets. Uh, when I turned 16, 17, I migrated to a neighborhood where my father was killed, and I thought the best decision was to carry a firearm in that dangerous area where we seen a lot of murder take place. And I ended up catching the case, and when I caught a case, uh, a cop charged me with pointing a gun at a cop in a part that you left out too, uh, a direct sale was selling crack. I made, a, I made a, a vow to myself not to sell crack just because a lot of women in my neighborhood, a lot of family members was on crack. So my choice as an 18-year-old, I was always selling marijuana, but unfortunately I still got found guilty for selling crack and pointing a gun at an a, a officer. Uh, Mike is a successful businessman. He don't come from the hood. Uh, I can explain it that way, but me hanging with him for, I think, since 2014-15, I used to ask him twice a year, like, do you think I pointed a gun at a cop just from you hanging with me? And I just couldn't let that fly by with hanging with somebody that didn't come from my environment and them having that on my record as a felon and me pointing a gun at an officer. I wanted them to know that when I'm around your daughter, I'm not a guy that'll point a gun at a, a cop. You know, that's just like character bearing for me. And I kept saying it. And one day I ended up in a position, and I wasn't in a per perfect position. Uh, I was on probation for 10 years. I did get addicted to Percocets uh, along the journey. I started taking them like yesterday. My tooth cracked on the plane. Y'all ain't see it, one of my teeth cracked. So I got to get one of my teeth fixed when I go back. But I got my wisdom too pulled out back then, and you know I ended up getting addicted to Percocets. I never thought Percocets could even do that to your body being prescribed from a doctor. I thought like drugs on the street could do things like that instead of something that was prescribed. And I got addicted beyond something I can imagine. And going into a probation office, if you, well, when I was on Philadelphia probation, if you told them that you got high nine times out of 10, you would go to jail. So who's gonna sign up to go to jail when you, to tell the truth, you know? And I, I used to lie sometimes when I go and I got caught up and she sent me in, in and out of prison. And you know, I was, uh, me, I'm fortunate to be in the position I am and I had a long ride. I didn't have a lucky ride, a special ride. I've been through a lot of stuff, but uh, I learned along the way. And I got my probation moved to a suburban neighborhood and I did that because in a suburban neighborhood, they don't treat the the probationers as hostile because it might not be all black. So, you know, I moved it to Mike neighborhood. And when I moved to my neighborhood, it was a lady. She asked me, do I have a drug problem? And I just said, yes. And when I said yes, she asked me, how can I deal with it? I told her that I'm a celebrity. You know, I'm not comfortable with just talking about my drug problems in a room. Like if somebody else say their story, we wouldn't know their background because it's a normal person. But if I said my story in a room, it's like me telling my business to everybody. So I wasn't comfortable. She let me sign up for like a, a private counseling when I was able to handle it, and I handled it. I never took a Percocet in the last five or six years due to that. And before that, I went to prison two or three times for taking Percocets, you know. I, I couldn't figure it out while I was sitting in a penitentiary or a county with people that's fighting homicides and rapes and things like that. And I basically had to, through my whole adult life as a young black kid, you know, stay on the line of who I wanted to become. I almost felt myself, I basically felt myself in jail, how I was able to get out and actually become who I became in these times of, even just being Meek Mill, I always say like, I ain't make it to the NFL, but I'm Meek Mill. I tell kids in the street like, I grew up watching Menace to Society, wanting to be like old dog, you see them hold their guns sideways, or like watching pay and fall. Now I tell young boys, you could be like a Meek Mill, you don't gotta snitch on nobody, you don't gotta go to jail, you don't gotta hurt nobody. You can help people in your community and make money and be a person of a certain caliber without having to kill nobody, hurt nobody, sell drugs to your community because that's what we was raised on, you know? And you might hear me speak on that in my music because that is my life and that is my past with damaged me and my family and I can't remove that. 
But all my music, I try to make it proactive. I give people both sides of where I come from. So if you hear anything ignorant in my music, I do know better and I know about both sides of life. <laughs> but it's a side of life. I've been on that side of life longer than I've been on this side. And I tell Governor Pritzker, like, just being an artist coming from the hood, even being a, in a room with you guys working on anything involving the system, I, I'm the one that grew up uh, a drug baby, want to fight on crime, your dad in prison or dead, um, you got an 80% chance of going to prison or dying after your five. I was one of those babies. A single parent home, uh, my mom used to drink alcohol, hanging bars, but she made sure that she kept our family tight. And when I turned 18, I did everything that I could to make sure I take care of my mom, grandma, and my sister. And it worked out fortunate for me, and I'm here to be an inspiration. I didn't know it could go this far, but through Mike, uh, Mike, like she said, her, her husband was killed, uh, her, her, her daughter's father. I talked to Mike and them, and they used to say, like, they don't know nobody that got killed and things like that. And, you know, I never heard that before. You know what I mean? And people, they said, they don't know nobody. And I, I, I welcome to my world a little bit into prison. I let them come to the studio, hear my friends talk, let them know we're not going to summer camp. We might die this summer. We might go to jail. And when they heard these things, it kind of affected them. I knew it attached to them emotionally. And, he jumped on his ride with me, so I salute Mike. I salute all these people here uh, from Chicago, Governor, Lieutenant Governor, uh, Jihan, everybody. I don't know everybody by name, but <laughs> this this uh, milestone for me, just coming from for all artists, because before this, you know, we get paid better to act out. You know, they give us more money when you do crazier stuff in the industry. I'm the one that's a little bit older in the middle, and I'm trying to hold the line. And I'm going to continue to do that. So I just thank everybody for giving me the opportunity for being in this position. Anything else? Any questions, anybody, too? <laughs> I get nervous when I got to talk, but I don't get nervous when I got to rap. But I appreciate you guys. Thank you.